Dear participants, welcome to the online lecture held by Jean Monet Chair at RGSL, Professor Ilse Rose. I'm happy to welcome you and devote a lecture to EU as a global actor, EU external action service, its structure, composition functions. This lecture is recorded as a part of online recordings in framework of Jean Monnet Chair funding. And I will devote my time in introducing the actors of the EU decision-making institutions, but also external challenges that European Union is facing and how the treaties allow the EU to handle these challenges, both with respect to external action, but also with respect to representation. So let's get started. Well, in 2020s, the EU is facing a lot of external challenges. If we would like to group them or to name them, we would end by explaining a currently ongoing Russia's aggression in Ukraine. Also, as we speak, we are having increasing conflicts and uncertainties in the Middle East. The previous crisis, but also crisis in Africa, external conflicts, internal turbulences are the causes of migration. So migration can also be considered as part of challenges that EU is facing externally. Hybrid threats in country like the Baltic um, states migration has become instrumentalized by state actors. So other hybrid threats can be also disinformation or false information on trying to portray country as a failed state or to act and meddle in countries election processes. So hybrid threats are numerous and difficulty with hybrid threats is that you can hardly tell when the attack begins or possibly it's already ongoing. Among other, EU is facing numerous cyber threats and cyber attacks, both on institutions, on countries, on infrastructure, also on international organizations. Cyber threats are most dangerous when they are generated by state actors. With regard to uncertainties and war going on, a consequence is that once EU starts applying also restrictive measures, so the um, response of states that are subjects of these restrictive measures answer also by destabilizing energy supply. But also states that put restrictive measures partly also refrain from using energy sources from countries in question. So currently EU has put a row of restrictive measures in Russia and the result has been that uh, the cut of energy supply from Russia has become a political commitment. And with this in mind, there has been need to replace energy supply and energy security has become an issue, not only as a conditionality in our response to countries in 
generating aggression and generating war, but also our EU security on how to distribute energy across member states. So energy security, energy supply, energy connectivity is and definitely an issue that external relations deal with. To continue, hybrid threats can be expressed in nature of affecting strategic infrastructure. So strategic infrastructure, both revealing the, the um, party behind the attack, but also defending strategic infrastructure is part of EU's coordinated action. As part of challenges the EU is facing, listing from war, migration, hybrid threats, energy security, we should definitely also speak about climate changes, climate changes and climate changes, crisis that EU is um, actually facing um, as a global actor and trying also to deal as a leader among the global partners with framing an ambitious climate change policy itself and giving a strong mandate to the Commission to represent the climate policy by EU in international uh, convention on climate. Everything that mentioned above, the challenges in external environment also put huge risk on relocation of people, on uh, food crises that are emerging for di from different reasons that can be from um, starting from the kind of determined policy to limit food access um, as a consequence possibly also that emerge from Russia's behavior after um, offending uh, Ukraine, but also food crisis emerging from climate changes, food crisis emerging from migration. And here it goes hand in hand that food crisis and poverty is also a, one of the root causes for migration. So everything mentioned here is interlinked and where these threats become quite horizontal in also way how to address them. And recently the commission that has every year delivered State of Union speech is also actually changing its tone in handling its external relations. If, like 10 years ago, if we would listen to the Commission President's speech, then the speech would be very much in political science terms normative. This would address EU as a global actor that takes care, that is um, devoting its attention to global partners in need with development aid, with conditionality, with uh, trade deals, encouragement with human rights initiatives. So in contrast to purely normative approach, we can observe a pattern shifting more to real politics terms. So we have a commission, the commission institution and also member states acting more in real politics manner, both member states in pre protecting their national interests, so putting na national interests on the first hand, but also 
the European Commission putting a different approach in how to handle also conditionality uh, with regard to creating stability, peace, uh, and restrictive measures or sanctions is part of this realpolitik, of this way of shifting to more conditionality-based external relations. But during the lecture, we will come back to this. As mentioned, putting national interests in first place also leads to divergences in preferences in the member states' approaches. In general, external relations and foreign affairs is definitely the field where member states act on intergovernmental mode, meaning that general interest is mainly the pattern of decision making when we deal with community method where the commission proposes the proposal for initiative and then it's passed through council and uh, the parliament whereas when we deal with external relations of the eu then the decision making mode turns out to be much more nation state driven and this also explains that one of the most important challenges or actually key for success of EU to become a strong global actor is to overcome differences among member states. So in two words, European Union unity. Well, we have quite a um, list of challenges that EU as a global actor has to face. What is the legal basis of EU to do so? It is important to remind that EU can act only within the mandate given by Lisbon Treaty. So the treaty defines the scope within which EU can act to face conflicts, wars, migration, climate change, food crisis, energy issues, and you name it. So everything can be done only within the scope that is assigned conferred to the institutions by the treaties. In case EU would, would be willing to go further, like ideas of opening up of qualified majority voting in common foreign security policy issues, then the ch treaty change would be necessary for really significant changes of actorness of the EU, but currently EU can do only what is given by treaty mandate. But it's quite much. So the scope of action where EU is entitled to engage is defined in the treaty article and to list the fields where the global actorness of EU is expected is safeguarding values and fundamental interests, also security, independence, and integrity. EU is definitely expected to support democracy, to support rule of law, to always fight for human rights in the world and to be garden of international law. Quite ambitious 
task of the EU written in the treaty is to preserve peace. We will come to the institutional tools that the EU has for this task, but also to prevent conflicts. So how can EU do, do the task that actually is very far reaching within the scope of the treaties? Further, EU is expected to work for integration of countries into the world economy, to work for global environment and global sustainable development, including also for climate change, to protect population, but also infrastructure in both man-made disaster but also nature made disaster. And finally, how to do this? To do this also through multilateral cooperation, which means that EU becomes part of global actorness, integrating also its role in cooperation with international organizations. So EU has a voice to express and voice to coordinate while acting as a party in multilateral cooperation. For this very interesting field, a separate online lecture is recorded under Jean Monnet project. So let's get now closer and more focused on how the EU can express its global activeness. So what kind of instruments does the EU have in order to formulate its position which is not easy at all, and also to pass the message both to the global actors, but also to international community. Some of examples. The first example, CFSP, common foreign security policy positions. So common foreign security policy is formulated by the member states in foreign affairs councils and under the chairmanship or leadership of high representative vice president of, of the union, who is not in charge of shaping CFSP but rather coordinating with the member states, leading the process, and then also interacting with the commission in implementing it, or with the member states in bringing action further. So CFSP is definitely the platform where such instruments as restrictive measures um, or European Union joint statements or U European Union reactions on topical external relations issues are framed. This includes also defense, but in during the lecture, we will come closer to the also articles that define the scope within which European Union can act when we speak about defense. So as a rule, European Union does not overlap with NATO, but has its very concrete scope of action under the treaties. Justice and Home Affairs, GHA, under these actions, the EU is definitely 
more with the also engagement of uh, ministers of uh, justice. EU is capable on acting on migration issues, but also acting on issues with regard to international law. Like recently, the issues of, of accountability, how to bring Russia accountable for its aggression on Ukraine was very much also agreed within the framework of GHA, Justice and Home Affairs. External economy policy, tariffs, quotas, it is definitely something that EU has at hand for uh, its conditionality. So um, also reaching out to um, other third countries uh, with economic tools. So economic policy will definitely bring uh, in other council formations apart from foreign ministers only. Trade agreements, association agreements or partnerships. These instruments are important important external relation domain where the EU is shaping the partnership and relationship with global partners. So every commission puts on agenda the short-term goals and long-term goals, how to deal with global actors by agreeing on trade agreements or deep and comprehensive trade agreements, the next generation deeper and more comprehensive interaction with the countries. These agreements may be also part of tools how to integrate global partners into the closer relationship with the Union as a first step, for example, for European integration. And as an example there, we can mention the association trade agreements that are signed with the countries of Eastern neighborhood. Humanitarian aid is a response by the EU that is reached out to regions in need. It can be related to poverty or um, like disturb, disturb food chains, but humanitarian aid is definitely a tool uh, where Europe is acting rapidly on uh, needs after conflict in conflict zo zones in as a result of man-made disaster or nature disaster. So humanitarian aid is part of external relations and in many countries also under the chapeau of minister of trade and minister of development. So humanitarian aid can be union wide with funds and instruments, but also member states can take individual action by reaching out to um, disaster regions like after earthquake. We have already mentioned restrictive measures, economic sanctions that are efficient, but efficient in long-term perspective. So this lecture will not focus on sanctions specifically, but sanctions as a very efficient tool in handling also impunity matters and also bringing the parties, state parties or individuals accountable for the violation of international law.
Conditionality may work as an instrument by the EU external policy, both in, for example, setting up trade deals, but also bringing countries closer to the EU, EU integration, the uh, specifically the accession enlargement articles that deal with the uh, future membership of country into the EU is related to conditionality. So there is carrot stick policy. So conditionality is efficient only when there is something to give, but also something to take. To summarize, it seems that external policy by the European Union, for the first, it's very broad, but it also correlates with the diversity of challenges that EU is facing. So in order to be able to handle these challenges, EU's response also needs to be very broad. So, Starting from foreign and security policy to security and defense policy, but further expanding to external relations in terms of economic policies, trade, climate, energy, poverty, handling natural disasters, humanitarian aid, human rights. So all this frames EU as a global actor because in the treaty and in the objectives of the external relations, as we read before in the slide, EU is working for making the global community more value-based, more democratic, more integrated and more fair trade based. So this means that it is not only about foreign policy, but in fact, it is about EU's external action that is cross-pillar. And by framing it as cross-pillar, we are engaging here with more decision-making bodies and more institutions than foreign policy only. So cross-pillar would mean that external relations are realized through including justice and home affairs, including trade council, including general affairs council that prepares European council, including Environment Council that deals with env environment and climate, including internal issues and competitiveness of the EU, once it about deep and compre comprehensive agreements with the third countries. So the lecture now will focus more on going deeper into the structure and actors. And we will also speak about external action service that has a prominent role in this cross-pillar implementation of EU's external action. Well, if you are watching this online lecture, then by now your answer should be, yes, I know who is this man. We want to speak here more about High Representative Vice President of Security Policy of and External Relations of the EU and about the position, how this is defined also in the treaties. So 
The person we see here is Joseph Borel, who became elected as high, represent high representative vice president of the commission 2019, and his term will end in 2024. So 24, there will be a next round of nomination of high positions of the EU institutions that will also start new legislative cycle for five years onwards. So here for five years, former Spanish foreign minister has been in charge in leading European external action. His position was created as an innovation, institutional innovation by Lisbon Treaty. Before that, the previous treaties were more focusing on high representative within his powers embedded in council. So this would mean the left part of the structure here. But given previously discussed challenges that can be solved only by external relation instruments that lie within mandate of the Commission, development policy, humanitarian aid, neighborhood policy, enlargement, trade, climate, environment, you name it, then the Lisbon Treaty took the step forward and applied double-hatted position to this institutional body had high representative. So which means that high representative has on one side the engagement with intergovernmental body council where member states, 27 member states act together and high representative is leading their work. He's not formulating, but he is in charge of coordinating, leading and even proposing. CFSP, CSDP matters, and here very much helped by External Action Service in acronym EEAS. But on the other hand, High Representative is also Vice President of the Commission President. So in this portfolio, he currently, he before she, but we'll see who will be elected next has responsibility for developing positions together with the commission, but also agreeing and implementing external policies. And here, commission works together with council, with the European Parliament, if this is a legislative act, and then with external action service that implements. And uh, this graph also helps to understand both the limitations of high representative once it comes to representation, because when we speak about trade and when we speak about development policy or, or neighborhood policy or setting new partnerships, then to some extent, the high representative is overshadowed by president of the European Commission because then the president will be seen as a representing figure. We will get there about representation, but the main focus of, of understanding this is also being able to then understand which kind of legal acts are set on each of the uh, 
um, responsibility side. So what is the outcome of foreign policy and what is the outcome of external relations? To start with, as explained in my previous slides, the European Union can act only where the treaty confers powers to the European Union. So principle of conferral. So we need to look closer into articles that define European Union distribution of competences. So there are three groups of competences and CFSP, Common Foreign Security Policy, actually does not fit in any of them. So CFSP is neither exclusive, because if it were exclusive, we could compare it to trade, uh, where all member states actually unite around a mandate, a single mandate that is given to commission. And then the commission, a supranational institution, presents with third countries. This would contradict the principle of sovereignty where the foreign policy is still very close to heart, to sovereignty and, and national interests in framing independent way of actually internally agreeing on the foreign policy. So how to handle this very different way of policy into the treaty? And therefore, the lawyers drafting treaty in, in yes, well, it was starting with a constitutional treaty that further was, was turned into Lisbon Treaty, Treaty Functioning of European Union. So they put CFSP as a category of its own. So neither exclusive nor shared, nor coordinated but it is a category sui generis. And when we read the article, it's quite well-known article 42, because the article deals with defense, and uh, this has been also used by an article of guarantees from the other member states in case of crisis. Solidarity article. So when Sweden was considering either to join NATO or to stay neutral and be protected by article 42, so this very article, and then uh, of course the question arises to what extent this article is binding to member states. And let's let's have a closer look to the Article 2.2 part, which is just framing the direction. So the union, union's competence in matters of common foreign security policy shall cover all areas of foreign policy and all questions relating to the Union's security. But now, be careful when reading the second part of it, including the progressive framing of a common defense policy that might lead to a common defense. You do not need to be lawyer to understand that this is quite a vague formulation. Well, it mentions foreign policy element. It mentions defense policy element. But given that in the European Union, there are countries that are not NATO countries that possibly would not be willing to the degree necessary also to engaged in to be engaged 
in common defense policy. So the article offers a very flexible language, meaning progressive framing of defense policy. And about common defense, it just says it might lead to a common defense. So I stop here. I leave it for your consideration how you see the legal mandate of European Union in carrying out the actions in CSDP. Having said that, I also want to draw your attention that the language of this article does not keep countries that are ambitious and willing to go further to deal and frame joint actions. We will not go deeper into the into the um, concept of um, PESCO, but this is one of the ways how the willing under this article can become more ambitious. Why is it so difficult to agree on foreign policy? Why is it difficult to be united? And this question was also asked by American scholar Roger Morgan, who distinguished politics in two, in two groups, in two approaches. The one being high politics and the other low politics. The high politics definitely deal with topics and fields where national state, nation state has a strong national interest that are close to sovereignty where both constitution matters, domestic policy matters, and also differences in historical experience or location also matter. And foreign policy and defense policy is among high politics. The other fields where we can apply high politics lens is taxation, but also labor law. It could also definitely be the everything around the national army and territory. So high politics also in the EU treaties have never been integrated to the extent that it becomes the community method handled matters. So the commission and the European parliament has been held a bit away from decision-making putting the main focus on decision-making by member states, so that the outcome is by member states. And also the decision-making mode in terms of voting has differed. So high politics most likely will be decided by unanimity or consensus-based decisions, whereas low politics, like internal market, like digital, um, deepening of digital market, 
uh, also education or environmental standards. These are policies where laws and legal instruments can be harmonized, but not in high politics. We will speak about the instruments, but when we speak about common print security policy and defense policy, mainly these councils would agree on council conclusions that are adopted by unanimity. And then on the basis of these council conclusions, then the legal acts may emerge. But the first political decision will be taken definitely by every member being able to put veto. Or the text is just negotiated until it is acceptable for everyone. Now getting to actors in uh, foreign policy. This seems kind of institutional jungle. But during the lecture and during other online lectures that are available under Jean Monnet project, we have explained the decision making and the uh, mandate and also the structure of each of these institutions. Once we speak about foreign affairs, we are more interested about this red part. As mentioned before, foreign affairs and defense issues are mainly intergovernmental. So we have mainly minister to minister, member state to member state, head of state to head of state process. To balance this, these processes are handled by the permanent chairs. The European Council meeting is led and chaired by the European Council president. And the Foreign Affairs Council meeting is led by high representative, also vice chair of the commission president. But some exceptions mean that ministers of trade would lead trade configuration under foreign affairs and the ministers of development will lead the work under the presidency chapeau for the ministers of development. This all being supported by council secretariat and also by ambassadors from corporate two and in some cases corporate one ambassadors. The work starts with the council groups and we will get there. So here a summary of actors in making decisions in foreign policy and external relations. We will touch upon commission. We will spend more time to European Council and Council. And we will briefly mention parliament being marginal when we speak about foreign policy, but being politically important. Another slide actually explaining that was already put in the previous here, who are making foreign policy in the EU? Which are the actors on every institution's level? So on the commission level, we boil down to director general, direct DGs as called in the European language, DGs. So DG Nair would engage in European neighborhood policy. Uh, DEFCO will be import important when dealing with development aid and so on. If it comes to parliament in the parliament committees, or if it is a process that is driven by parliament as a result of, for example, resolution, then it also goes through parliament committees, also thematical committees. Now about 27 member states. As explained, 27 member states, member states would be the main 
the main chefs in this foreign affairs policy kitchen. So member state ministers, also ambassadors, so political security, so-called PC ambassador, and military committees, foreign affairs ministers um, of different council formations. So under configurations under foreign affairs can be also development or defense or trade, but also not to forget general affairs council that may develop um, positions as an input for European Council. And the General Affairs Councils are led by presidency and the foreign ministers or EU ministers are sitting from 27 member states. And finally, about European External Action Service. We need to be careful in also uh, definitions. So External Action Service is not an institution. It is a body that implements the mandate and supports the high representative as a president in carrying out it, his or her responsibilities. And External Ag uh, Action Service has a headquarters and also delegation network abroad. Mentioned like, will be mentioned later uh, during this lecture. As explained previously, among five types of legislative instruments that are part of uh, Lisbon Treaty Article 289, so regulations, directive, decisions that are all binding, have direct effect or indirect effect, are decided in core legislative process with the European Parliament, they may be as a secondary instrument in implementing action. But the decision, political decision on agreeing on action is actually done by council conclusion. So council conclusion is a political document. It is a political agreement between the member states that is drafted by council secretariat and agreed by unanimity. So here again, we come back to the graph that puts external relations in a framework that CFSP and CSDP is not only action that EU is doing in reaching out its global activity. There's also external policies. And then what are the instruments, the legal instruments or the output of the council once agreeing. Then for CFSP, CSDP, these are council conclusions, council decisions. We will get later, there's a longer list that may further be encourage and trigger legal acts. But the legal acts directives, regulations, decisions are mainly applied to external policies that are under the community method and under the commission. In case we have a typical legislative act, it starts with the initiative by the commission and it goes on by co-legislative process by council and European council, sorry, by European parliament, and it ends by Adoption and then commission monitoring, also implementation, and in case of deviations or non-compliance, then European Court of Justice comes in. This is not applied to foreign policy. So no matter, no council conclusion agreed among the foreign ministers can come directly to European Court of Justice. There are matters that come to European Court of Justice related, for example, to sanctions, but the sanctions then are adopted by a legal act. So what is then the principle of the initiative 
making in foreign affairs and uh, security policy. It is explained by Article 17, where it stated that normally, as a default, union will act and adopt legal acts on basis of commission proposal. But then, except where treaties provide otherwise. And CFSB falls under this except. So, in case of common foreign security policy, Article 24 applies, and Article 31 applies, that state that the legislative acts are not originally adopted on an issue to be handled, but mainly the initiative comes from the member state or a pro proposal from higher representative or a proposal from higher representative supported by the commission. So much more intergovernmental way of initiating a legal issue. So we don't see commission's role here. So in case of council conclusion, the council conclusions will be rather drafted by the council secretariat. So he, this uh, slide puts a summary, member states, high representative or high representative and the commission. These are the initiators. So which means that any member state, including Latvia, can become an initiator of a legal proposal, a legal political issue to be handled in the council. As explained before, the Foreign Affairs Council or council dealing with CFSP mainly decide on uh, council conclusions. This includes also enlargement. But then after this political decision that is made by unanimity, then the council conclusions can trigger adoption of legal acts. And then under ob objection, under the uh, adoption of legal acts, then the qualified majority vo voting is applied. Now we have an ongoing open discussions among the member states. Some member states are in favor. Latvia is hesitant to switch in foreign affairs and security policy matters from unanimity to qualified majority voting. So we are not there yet, but the discussion is ongoing and we are actually facing a new legislative cycle starting next year. We hear ideas coming from the commission we hear ideas coming from the institutions so we just need to be alert and we need to follow also the application practical application of voting in cases like for example the eu strategy on human rights where the QMB may be integrated just as a part of an overall document that is already putting member states a, close, a step closer. But as said, currently the decision is applied when the adopting council conclusions with unanimity. I leave for individual work a link to Council conclusions. It is something to be studied and uh, analyzed. So, Council conclusion is a document that comes from Secretariat. 
and is passed to 27 member states. This case is about EU's digital diplomacy. And as it shows, the Council conclusion also in its legal structure and the document shape very much differs from any other legislative act. Here, what is important that it is a political document that every word, every phrase counts. So once adopted, this is what the member states have agreed upon. So sometimes it may happen that member states um, once they cannot agree on strong commitment, the outcome of the council becomes a lowest common de denominator. So the language is weak because only the language that countries can unite upon is the one that can be adopted. So what else? is then the instrument of the foreign policy. Union may adopt strategies, just mention the human rights strategy. Human, then Union can adopt member states or joint statements. It can be a declaration, it can be opinion, it can be just a position by one, two, more member states, joint position. Sometimes it is a non-paper. A single member state can issue a non-paper and then others may co-sponsor it, just join in. But in uh, as an uh, urgent reaction, the immediate action by the EU normally is a press release, press statement, or statement by the press secretary of high representative, and sometimes followed, very often followed, by statements from the member states, also referring to the language of the union statement. Institutions one by one. We will spend a bit time with the Commission. This slide is interesting only to extent that it shows that the current Commission 2019 to 2024 works in clusters. So there is Team Europe cluster or Team External Europe, and then there is a climate cluster, and then there is social policy, and then there is uh, governance and, and, and so on cluster. But for this course, the cluster where high representative works together with, uh, the president of the commission works together with high representative is interesting. So this leads to different other commission portfolios that deal with development policy, with the European neighborhood, humanitarian aid, security and defense, relations with third countries and regions. Specifically, this commission has pointed out Africa because of reshaping the engagement with between the EU and Africa. There is also a target, stronger Europe means enlarged Europe, investing in peace. So the commission will definitely favor enlargement and uh, rules-based international cooperation with uh, close interaction with uh, internationalizations in multilateral system. Finally, trade policy. So the commission president through the commissioners that together work in commission college 
would design work for legal acts and trade agreements or strategies or partnerships for these uh, before mentioned objectives. And the work will be done politically on the level of decision makers, commission college, but then on the level of DGs, director generals. In comparison to other fields, and explained before when I initiated that member states actually keep control over common foreign security policy. Here in trade policy, development policy or enlargement or neighborhood policy, we have a strong engagement by the commission. So actually commission is the one that keeps control. It is both initiating the legislation, but also keeping member states together through asking to present mandate. So in order, for example, to negotiate on the Brexit uh, process, the commission negotiator was always awaiting agreement between member states presented as a mandate to the commission to speak on behalf of the member states. And also this applies to trade agreements and member states formally made mandate and the commission is both concluding negotiations, but also being an external representation face in these negotiations. Definitely commission is strong with regard to enlargement process because member states in the General Affairs Council agree upon the direction, for example, whether yes or not to propose European Council to agree presenting candidate status for Moldova and Ukraine. But then the Council tasks the Commission to go on with annual reports and report back on the results and progress. So again, the Commission is holding control with interaction with respective third country in this process. So therefore, it may seem that Commission is always more optimistic or more positive. But it's, I think I leave it with you listening to State of Union speeches by the Commission President. So the notion of openness for enlargement has been changing from year to year. And finally, the Commission is holding funding. And this is where the strength of the Commission is in keeping implementation role of implementing the actions and activities, programs, financial instruments through external action service or through any kind of European neighborhood policy instrument or others. As explained, intergovernmental actors are central in external relations. And here we have president of the European Council, high representative for foreign affairs and security policy. We have the council presidency, we have member states, and supported by corporate ambassadors, working groups, and council secretariat. So quite a lot of actors again. The European Council and its role has definitely increased during the years, but it also explains that European Union is much more engaged in handling external crises. So almost in every European Council conclusion, 
there is an agenda item on how Europe is handling another security policy crisis abroad, global conflict, or a disaster. So effective engagement of um, union in conflict resolution has become a mandate of level of heads of state engagement. So the output is different European Council conclusions, but then after them that trigger partnerships or different policy instruments, as mentioned before, or declarations or statements, or just positioning the European Council. Then it is interesting to note that European Council has a representation, also a mandate. And uh, in particular, this representation mandate goes through the president of the European Council. So president is the one um, that is leading the work of the European Council, heads of states format, once they agree upon not only crisis and external conflicts, but also kind of regular agenda, multi-annual financial framework, or enlargement, or um, just uh, internal issues of agreeing on internal market, digital market, um, European semester, and so on. The current president of the European Council is sitting until 2024. It's a former prime minister of Belgium, Charles Michel. And he is also having external representation power. And there we come to an interesting situation because European president, according to Article 15, has a capacity of external representation, but the same article says, without prejudice to the powers of other institutions like high representative of foreign policy and security policy. So that means that already in the treaty, there is an inbuilt competition between the institutional powers in field of representation. And we come back to this very well-known quote, when Kissinger wanted to call Europe, he asked, whom should I call? It's quite an open question, but there is a logic that we can search uh, in uh, the treaties. Before doing that, I want to attract your attention to um, a case that was named Softgate, when the Commission President Ursula von Leyen visited Turkish President together with European Council President Charles Michel, received by Turkish President and Turkish Foreign Minister. So there, there is not only a furniture issue or protocol issue, there's actually a competence issue, the representation competence issue. So what's wrong with this? Not speaking about gender, but should we change high European Commission president with European Council president in their seats. So answer is given here. Also representation power of the high positions is aligned with the logics in the treaties. So the question is always, what was the issue of the meeting? If the issue of the meeting was human rights, then it may be an issue handled by high representative and the European Council values. 
the rule of law aspects. Also, political aspects of European Council leaders agreeing on their relationship with Turkey. But if the issue at hand to be discussed is, you know, enlargement, opening of future chapters with Turkey, or interacting with trade deals, because we have currently also ongoing discussions on customs union arrangements with Turkey, then definitely the seat next to the president of Turkey should have been taken by the president of the commission. So the issue may also help to understand whether the European Council is in charge in agreeing on that, or it is the Commission's domain. Recent years have shown that not always it is so easy, not only because of personalities that take these positions, uh, but also because of some cases when the European Council has taken a role that possibly should have been taken by the European Commission. And here I refer to 2017 under migration crisis and Dutch EU presidency. Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte encouraged European Council to take lead and to agree with Turkey on the agreement on how to deal with migration. So this agreement on keeping migrants out and diminishing the influx of migration into the EU, again, uh, to some extent, even like stopping the huge wave of migration to the EU, was done between European Council and the respective trade third country, Turkey. And this became the case law in European Court of Justice because of issue of representation and a mandate. So uh, this is quite a sensitive aspect that deserves a lot of uh, treaty knowledge, but also, I would say, kind of political feeling. Who is taking the lead? Which of the actors in the institutions? We have already covered the uh, formal role of high representative under two chapeaux, Article 18 in Treaty of Functioning European Union actually frame it at the institutionally, it's a double-headed position. And high representative is chairing Foreign Affairs Council. Why was it introduced in 2009, because 2009, before the Lisbon Treaty changed the pattern of the council presidency being in lead on uh, most of the issues every six months. So foreign minister of respective country would have chaired the Foreign Affairs Council. And also the prime minister of respective country would have chaired the European Council. This ended by Swedish presidency 2009 in December. So after that, to ensure consistency and efficiency of European external relations, this is now taken by high representative and vice president of the uh, commission, because every six months, the country holding EU presidency may change the focus. And this would be confusing for external partners if Europe every six months would shift their focus of action. 
Foreign Affairs Council is one of most frequently convening councils. It's coming together every month on Mondays. And the, the this council configuration has also sub configurations. It may come together also under issues of defense, under issues of development, under issues of trade. And General Affairs Council would then deal with some issues relating to external relations, to some extent, even budget, multi and annual uh, framework, also enlargement issues. But most specifically, General Affairs Council would prepare European Council meetings, which is already discussed format of high commitment of heads of states. With your engagement alone, I would now invite you also to think about such tasks like which council formation would consider these issues, sanctions, Is it foreign affairs? Is it trade? Is it competitiveness? Or maybe justice and home affairs? So in the several in the same mode, please think about issues like which council will consider investment dispute, which council should pass through and document on humanitarian aid package or defense fund for Ukraine or enlargement, or military equipment production. Think about it. The Working Council is not done by ministers only. It has to be prepared. Ministers every Monday come together. Given the agenda of the council meeting, they also may discuss issues that are coming from other council formation as B issues, and they just pass them as agreed, just to rubber stamp. But then they would focus on the outstanding agenda items. These items are prepared by ambassadors, normally corporate two ambassadors, but most specifically by working parties. The graph here, explains fields and policies under responsibility of each of corporate ambassadors. So to some extent, Antichi, senior diplomat to corporate, would be mainly engaged in issues that are related to external relations. But it doesn't exclude that also corporate one may contribute to work of external relations, like energy, or like climate, you name it. This graph explains the logics of the working groups that deal with foreign affairs and common security defense policy. So, when Lisbon Treaty was adopted in 2009, it included only one sentence that high representative should coordinate and lead the work of foreign affairs and security policy supported by external European external relations. EEAS. And as a consequence of Lisbon Treaty adopted 2009, a year later, 2010, the Council decision defined a functioning of European External Action Service. So in this decision of 2010, the distribution of roles was set that on geographical 
logics. This will be permanent chair of the working group of European External Action Service. So the names of these MAMA, COEST, COVEP, COASI, Transatlantic Relations Africa. So whenever we have an issue of conflict crisis in Africa, then it would be cooperate under the chairmanship of external action service that will consider this and prepare a document. And uh, then horizontal issues like um, you see in the graph, they are dealt with partly external action service, but also partly with the presidency. And this was the decision by um, 2010 uh, that actually divided these roles. In um, five years later, there was attempt to review this decision and possibly to change the distribution of competences between and and get maybe more powers to the presidency, but it did not change. So currently um, there is always a logic that there are some working groups that are chaired by the permanent uh, external action service uh, civil servants, but then the rest are still under presidency. So this is important to bear in mind when the country is preparing for the EU presidency so that it has to get an experienced and uh, negotiation leading capable experts who will then take the role of chairs in these working groups. May be difficult to understand but actually is putting together the logic that was explained before, that the rotating presidency still has control of some of working groups in external relations, the list before, the slide before. Then presidency has competence and chair the trade con configuration, general affairs configuration, and the geographical groups are under the external action service political security committee ambassadors under external action service and also foreign affairs council chaired by joseph borrell so what is the council secretariat doing this is a permanent institution much smaller size of administration compared to the commission. But the role of uh, council secretariat is to support with producing documents, spreading and circulating information, partly also dealing with protocol, for example, size of delegation, how long, long, large the delegation for council meeting should be, keeping record also, um, again, circulating through the channels, um, internal channels, the, the documents or minutes, um, and also assisting in the building in place in Brussels once delegations arrive. Important part, Council Secretariat also includes EU lawyers. And in many cases, there are issues that has to be carefully handled in particular with the with the sensitivity to the issue that are at hand but also with respect to the um, possible consequences of these decisions like in case of agreeing on sanctions so that keeping in mind that the persons sanctioned may bring the issue to the European Court of Justice. Several steps in preparing the Council, where groups are involved, working groups, then ambassadors from PSC, corporate ambassadors, and then Council Secretariat is circulating agenda, preparing 
and circulating language in council documents, negotiation documents are delivered in close cooperation with the presidency country. And also the agenda sometimes includes A or B, any other business matters where member states can rise and address issues that are either for information or for attracting attention and future action. The voting in council is currently mainly a unanimity on council conclusions. European Council agrees on unanimity. Abstention is not qualified as no, but there is also interesting pattern that CFSP includes constructive abstention. So if country abstains under this clause, then this means that not only that country is not part of agreement, it doesn't stop its implementation, but the respective country would not implement this measure in their own policy. But there is also a limit if the constructive abstention applies to a larger number of uh, member states, then this means that this two instrument of foreign policy will not be efficient and effective. So uh, then the decision does just don't um, result in agreement. Um, QMV may be applied when the decision is followed uh, by an implementing legal instrument, directive or any other um, legal um, outcome. And then to mention that foreign affairs ministers meet once every presidency in a, a format that is called Gimnich meeting. And it is an informal exchange of views where ministers um, are not producing binding outcome, but are agreeing on, um, you know, state status quo um, of, of different processes or uh, conflicts, they they just uh, analyze, exchange views, um, and sometimes this serves as a basis for generating uh, further actions already on the formal level. It was already explained about constructive abstention. And then finally about external action service. External Action Service consists of both headquarters and uh, foreign delegations. Um, the, um, the service is based um, as a, a separate body in Brussels um, with uh, both these geographic desks and also thematic desks. To become a part of External Action Service, a person has to be either employed with the commission, affiliated with the council secretariat, or be a diplomat from one of the member states. So vacancies are distributed to these institutions. And um, uh, once in place, the EU delegations do not replace member states' embassies. They deal with the uh, foreign policy that is framed by the European Union. Of course, member states align with this policy, but to, in contrast of uh, the member states' bilateral embassies, for example, the EU delegations do not deal with separate consular cases. Yet, if there is a crisis or a disaster where the EU citizens need to be relocated or sent to the safety to other uh, places, then the external action service takes the lead. In Brussels, the high representative has senior management. It has situation center, very important it is like, 24-7 following and giving expertise on the uh, global state of arts. 
and then it has geographical and thematic themes. There is circulation and rotation. So once a person becomes um, employed at external action service or has a contract, so the contract means that a person has to rotate from delegation and possibly for two, per two four periods, but then also there is a balance between, with regard to the difficulty of the postings. And finally, Parliament. As explained, Parliament's role is political. If we compare Parliament in uh, decision-making on community method, then the Parliament has co-legislator's role. In CFSCP matters, Parliament is a um, political actor where the Commission and High Representative and um, Member States Presidency just inform Parliament about ongoing activities. The Parliament was willing to be engaged in external action service once it was set up, but currently European Parliament has just consulting in uh, nature of um, uh, on the functioning of uh, the external action service. Yet, there are fields where the European Parliament's role is very, very instrumental. And actually, in fact, European Parliament can stop adopting, ad uh, stop from, from, be, from, from being adopted also uh, external relation instrument like treaties and international agreements. So here, the Parliament votes with consent and has power of blocking and vetoing. Otherwise, political power of passing resolutions that is also very important and also encouraging a lot of further initiatives that actually are triggered by Parliament. And Parliament is also active player in human rights. So values of the union, garden of the values of the union, encouraging the presidency, the high representative to step up for these values. So this ends my lecture on external global actorness. And I would like to thank your attention and ask to follow other online lectures by Jean Monetier. Thank you. <laughs>